Inshallah, today we are, we will try to conclude the discussion about uh, knowledge and uh, it's a topic that is almost impossible to to finish because everything actually goes back to knowing how to know and uh, what are the implications of knowing and what are the implications of not knowing. And all of this uh, rooted in the Quran, in the Sunnah, as well as uh, the entirety of our tradition. <clears throat> وَعَلَّمَا آدَمَ الْأَسْمَا كُلَّهَا ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ فَقَالَا أَنْبِئُونِ بِيَسْمَائِهَا أُولَائِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِكِينَ This is the ayah with which we started a discussion on what was taught to Adam alayhi salam. And over the last three sessions we have established the fadila, the blessings, the high high station of knowledge. There is no human being who would dispute about uh, knowledge being superior to ignorance. There is no possibility of uh, any rational person disputing that. The problem that uh, we face today is the definition of knowledge not being as clear as, as it used to be. Information being considered knowledge, and most of all, the lack of a high, high, hier hierarchical system of knowledge, the lack of any gradation of knowledge, the lack of any uh, any criteria through which we can establish uh, which knowledge is beneficial. Um, what is the purpose of knowledge and 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 related issues? Inshallah, we are going to use uh, Kitabul Ilm of uh, Ahya Alumuddin of Imam Ghazali to anchor our understanding of knowledge in uh, in a systematic exploration of the subject, and I hope we can conclude. Uh, this today, to whatever extent Allah allows us to to conclude, and uh, I will share my screen with you so that uh, we have the same text in front of us. However, before we go into Imam Ghazali, uh, I want to point out two other things, and uh, they are also important uh, in terms of uh, our topic and discussion today. So let me begin with uh, sharing the screen, inshallah. This is the table of content of Kitabul Ilm, which is the first book of the 40 books of uh, Alumuddin. We are not going to study uh, the book itself, but the anatomy of knowledge in Islam is really something that we hope to understand. We hope to kind of have the outline of that uh, through uh, just discussing the table of content of Kitab al-Ilm, of Ihya al-Muddin, of Imam al-Ghazali. However, before we do that, <clears throat> I wanted to point out that uh, knowledge is something that distinguishes a believer, a Muslim, a follower of uh, 
the way of the Prophet wasalam, in a, in ways which are not available in other traditions. Knowledge is something that is so foundational in Islam that right from the beginning of the revelation, there has been emphasis on gaining knowledge. Ilm is something, as we mentioned several times in the previous three sessions, that is rooted deep in the Quran, in the Sunnah, in the prophetic teachings, and down to our own time. So we don't need to repeat that, but it's the question of um, our, our relationship with knowledge and the type of knowledge that is necessary for everyone and what do we do with knowledge. So just to clarify one more time, knowledge is, as in this ayah, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught knowledge of asma to Adam alayhi salam. When we said that ism is superior to fail and harf, and when we said that asma are stable, fail is connected with time, past, present, future, ism, a thing in itself, exists by itself, whether there is an observer or no observer, Whereas a fail, an action requires a file, the doer. An act requires a doer. Whereas a thing that exists in reality exists whether or not there is an observer. So when we say that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam names of everything, kullaha, that means he taught knowledge of things to Adam alayhi salam. That knowledge is transmitted knowledge, that knowledge is inherited, that knowledge is in the DNA, so to speak, because any, that is the in the constitution of human beings. The knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught is not of how to how to make money, how to construct homes, etc. This is fundamental knowledge, the knowledge that is required for human beings to pass through this life and go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The knowledge that he taught also includes the knowledge of things existing for us in the cosmos. And that knowledge requires that we, 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 acquire, we acquire the knowledge so that it becomes part of us, so that it becomes internally coexistent with our own being. So there is a knowledge, ilmul wajud, and then ilmul shahud. There is knowledge of being, and then there is knowledge of, uh, there is experiential knowledge. So al ilmu ilman, there are two types of knowledge. And uh, there are two types of knowers. One knower is the one who is benefiting from the knowledge and the other who is not benefiting from the knowledge. And the knowledge itself is of two kinds. One is praiseworthy and the other is the opposite of it. 
So this book that you see uh, here, the screen, I hope everyone can see this book. Uh, Zuhair bin Harb, he is even before Imam Bukhari. He is, uh, and he, he is the second century Hijra. He wrote a book called Kitabul Ilm. And if you look at the Kitabul Ilm here, the kind of structure that we have, the anatomy of, of the ilm we have, is a constant structure that comes down to our own times. The book begins with, uh, he says that uh, uh, he says that uh, This is the saying of uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who is he's reporting that through one, two, two chains. You call in istatata and takuna aliman fakun alima, failam tastati fakun mutaalima, failam takun mutaaliman fahibbahum. Yani. <laughs> Failam tohibbahum, tohibbahum, fala tabudhum. Fakala um subhana lahi lakadja lahu, lahum mahraja. He said that uh, be, be an alim, be a knower, be someone who has knowledge. If you have the, the, the strength, the ability to do so. And if you don't, then at least be a student. And if you cannot be a student, then at least love them and don't uh, have a, the opposite of love for them. And it, these are the states of a believer. Either you be a student or you be uh, a teacher or both because every teacher is a student and every student can be a teacher. So two learners all the time. And uh, any, we are going back to, inshallah, to soon. We are going to Imam, uh, Imam Ghazali's book on knowledge, but just wanted to, con to go back three centuries and look at the structure of Kitabul Ilm. This is the structure that is going to be more expanded in the Kitabul Ilm that, inshallah, we are going to go through. Just the table of content, and uh, this uh, this categorization of knowledge into two kinds, and the high station of uh, of the student. And the angels spread their wings for the talibil ilm, for the one who is seeking knowledge. And we always had these journeys for knowledge. We always had this huge emphasis on, uh, on knowledge in our tradition. So let's go back to uh, this one, Kitabul Ilm. As I said, we are not going to study the Kitabul Ilm, but we are going to go through the table of contents to such an extent that we are able to understand the anatomy of knowledge. And through that, uh, and through some of the you know, some of the details, hopefully we will get a clear understanding of. Uh, clear understanding of uh, <clears throat> the station of knowledge and the station of learning, inshallah. The first part, Fadilatul Ilm, the, and Fadilatul 
تعلیم و پدیدۃ التعلم یعنی دیر آر تھری کیٹیگریز رائٹ ہیئر ان ایٹ دا بگننگ آف کتاب العلم دا فرسٹ ون از دی فدیلۃ العلم دی دی دا ہائی اسٹیشن آف نالج ان اٹ And Imam Ghazali does exactly what uh, Zuhair bin Harb did, what uh, Imam Bukhari did, what everyone else did before him, a meaning going to the Quran and then to the Hadith and then to the saying of the Salaf. We did that to some extent. We, we have established that... Uh, uh, the hierarchy of being in the hierarchy of being those who have knowledge have a higher station than those who do not have knowledge and this applies to all domains of learning not just the religious knowledge yani even even in our secular understanding we do have a an inherent understanding of the high station of knowledge. So when we say in physics, we, we mention the name of Einstein or we mention the name of Newton, people do have a degree of receptivity to what an Einstein or what a Newton is going to say or has said. Uh, even in the Jahiliya, Even before Islam, those who had knowledge were considered higher in ranking, and that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his last messenger and the Quraysh wanted to confirm the claim to prophethood, what did they do? They sent a delegation to Yathrib, Medina later, uh, and they, they asked the Yahud, of Yasrab, uh, they told them that there is this man who claims to be a prophet, he has been among us, etc. What do you say? And they said, go back and ask him these three questions, and if the answers are correct, then he is a prophet. And those questions, we have discussed those before. They asked about uh, Zulkarnain, and they asked about, uh, uh, about Ruh, and they ask about the sleepers in the cave. So these were the things which distinguished the, the three tribes of Jews in, Madi in Yathrib at that time, later Medina, from the Quraysh in Mecca, as well as from the two uh, other Arab uh, Kabail, uh, Khazraj, uh, Any people who live with them, who are within, within Yasrab, Aus and Khaz, Banu Aus and Banu Khazraj, to the extent that they even sent their children to the Jews so that they will become learned. So the Jews, because of the knowledge, had a high ranking. And uh, this remained so in all spheres of Islamic civilization, in politics, in economics, in, uh, in, in education, uh, to the extent that uh, the, the political system that came into existence in Islam was based on knowledge. And the knowledge that they, uh, they used to... distinguish a and make a hierarchy of of people was knowledge that was fully internalized and turned into action there was no such thing as uh, knowledge without action yani to the extent that uh, in our tradition when uh, the transmission of the saying of sayings of the Prophet ﷺ took place, the criteria for taking a hadith from someone 
included the uprightness of character and included the actual existential reality of the sunnah being implemented. So anyone who was found not following the sunnah in his or her life was discredited. That it, he, he or she was not uh, considered an authentic narrator. To the, even to the extent that people, if someone would see somebody walking, you know, walking in the street or walking in the bazaar and eating something, like that person would be discredited just because of that act. So knowledge was essentially knowledge of of uh, uh, knowledge of of being, knowledge that was fully internalized and acted upon in all spheres, in mamala, in economics, in human interactions between husband and wife, like everywhere. So that part was to suffer a huge blow when this distinction appeared, and it appeared long time ago, but now it's just uh, so widespread that there is psychological schizophrenia to the extent that uh, it's, it has become the norm. So people, women would put on their uh, head, uh, cover their head when uh, somebody starts to recite the Quran and when they go out they will just take their covering away. People, men would go to the masjid and they come out and uh, like they are different people. This splitting of the being was inconceivable uh, to this extent. At, le at least at a certain level. I mean, people didn't consider anybody knowledgeable who did not practice what was taught. Imam Ghazali I mean, the, the beauty of Ihya is that uh, it is very structured, mabni, it's, it is thoroughly consistent. He always begins with the, with the Quran, goes to the Prophet Sallallahu goes to the Salaf, and uh, it's just... Um, so one of the, one of the calls that he mentions in the Fadilatul Ilm, in the high station of knowledge, is that he says the heart, the knowledge is the ghada, knowledge is the food of the heart. And if, uh, if, you, if you don't eat for a while, you will die. And if the heart does not receive knowledge, it dies. And one of the beauties is that uh, ilm and hikmah, knowledge and wisdom, are often combined in our tradition because the Prophet ﷺ was sent to, to give us both. Wisdom is... Wisdom is uh, the essence that one acquires through knowledge. Wisdom is, uh, is the real, real substance of knowledge. Wisdom is the inner reality of knowledge. And uh, uh, there is this uh, well-known saying that anyone who is ignorant is actually asleep. Any people who don't know, they don't even know that they don't know. And they are likened to people who are asleep. So, people who are asleep need to be waken up and when they awake 
then they realize they are bereft of knowledge. But the problem comes when emotions are preventing someone to acknowledge the lack of knowledge, and then it becomes impossible to learn anything. There is this well-known discussion about uh, in our tradition about the fadila, about the about the high station of knowledge compared to ibadah itself that is done without knowledge, the worship that happens without knowledge, and uh, there is overwhelming support for uh, for knowledge itself, meaning. Worship without knowledge of what we are doing becomes mechanical. Then we have the high station of uh, of, uh, the, of the students, and uh, traditionally, when people like Imam Bukhari, they left their uh, Bukhara, they left their uh, Khurasan, they went on on these journeys for knowledge they were honored. So the student was considered to be someone very special in our tradition. And uh, of course, those journeys were not easy at that time, and the knowledge they were seeking was not the knowledge of how to make money and how to join the corporation. They were seeking knowledge of the deen, they were People like Imam Bukhari, they were traveling for the sake of collecting an authentication of the sayings of the Prophet You see, the system that came into existence through the Talibul Ilm, through the through the seeking of knowledge, uh, has really left us with tremendous bounties. Like to be able to go back to the first century, second century Hijra, and know details of lives of individual scholars and students and transmitters of knowledge, to such an extent that you can almost imagine them in your minds, you can imagine their days and nights, you can see if you pay close attention to, say, Imam Bukhari sitting in the masjid of uh, the Prophet ﷺ and finalizing his Sahih al-Bukhari. This is an amazing, amazing aspect of our tradition, that this is an open source, fully disclosed, fully accessible tradition of knowledge, learning and seeking knowledge. Next we have, look at the structure. I just, because I said, I, we are not going to the book of knowledge of Ehya, but we are creating, we are hopefully creating enough thirst for someone to say, oh, I want to read this book. Look at it. It's 150 pages. I can read it. Translations are available in English, in Urdu, in Persian, in original is available. Like what would prevent any one of us to say, okay, I'm going to go through this book and know for myself what are the details. I hope, I hope everyone does that. So Fadilatul Ilm, the, the high station of knowledge, the high station of the seeker of knowledge, the high station of the teaching of no, teacher of knowledge, and then Fishawahidul uh, Aqaliya. Yani, first is the Quran, then the Prophet, وسلم, then the Salaf, and finally the last. Reservoir from which Imam Ghazali and many others would draw is the intellectual sciences. Like 
human intellect is uh, capable of knowing things and hi hierarchies of things, uh, but they are not at the same level as the Quran or the sayings of the Prophet or the sayings of the Salaf. So, any, and this is where really, <laughs> this is where Imam, Imam Ghazali's uh, excellence really shines because uh, Zuhair bin Harb used the Quran just as Imam Ghazali would do. He used the Sunnah as Imam Ghazali would do. And he, all of those, he used the sayings of the Salaf the same way. But when it comes to the Akaliya, the proofs, arguments, and, uh, and convince, convincing uh, strategies of uh, uh, rational kind. There are very few who would be equal to Imam Ghazali. One of the things is is uh, telling us is to use our intellect to be able to distinguish between two aspects of a of a question. Like this, critical thinking is probably very poor terminology for for what he is doing, and the examples he uses is they are just the metaphors, the scenery he constructs is just so convincing. Like he says. Um, when, when two things share a characteristic, how are you distinguish one is better than other? Which one is better than other? So the, there is a horse and there is a donkey. And they both share the characteristic of being able to carry your weight, carry your, carry your goods. But why is uh, why is a horse considered better than a donkey? And he says the horse is better than a donkey because in addition to carrying and the weight that the donkeys do, it's more beautiful. It's pleasant to look at. It uh, uh, and it's. Uh, it has other internal characteristics, like it can take take you to the to the battleground. It can uh, it can serve as your uh, as your mount uh, in in a battle, for instance. And it's more beautiful. And if someone says, "Well, I would I would uh, make my donkey beautiful by putting some uh, gold uh, some." Uh, gold decorating the donkey he says yes maybe it will it will look beautiful apparently but you cannot impart the same internal characteristics to the donkey because donkey donkeys just don't have those characteristics which which horses have so comparative knowledge Comparative knowledge of things is one of the ways in which we distinguish what is <coughs> inherently superior than others. Others. So in that case, is there a hierarchy of knowledge? <coughs> And this is the second chapter, Al-Bab Thani, Fil Ilm al Mahmud wal Mazmum. Can you imagine that knowledge can be can be 
praise worthy and it can be blame worthy when you think of uh, blame worthy knowledge obviously we know the the praise worthy knowledge knowledge and the highest of knowledge is the knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so anything connected with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praise worthy is that the real knowledge that is the real knowledge re required by the creation by creatures by us but what is blame worthy knowledge so blame worthy knowledge he says is the knowledge that harms you and that harm can be in this dunya and or in the hereafter or both so fil ilm al mahmud the praiseworthy knowledge is the knowledge that takes you to the destination which is to reach allah subhanahu wa taala and the blameworthy knowledge is the knowledge that takes you away from your real goal from your real purpose of being and that is uh, blameworthy because uh, it harms your real final outcome and the same knowledge can also be can also turn into blameworthy knowledge and he gives the example of the knowledge the astronomy astronomy when it becomes astrology it changes from praiseworthy to blameworthy so the knowledge of the movement of the stars and the planets is beneficial knowledge is praiseworthy knowledge but when that knowledge is used for foretelling uh, for astrology to make money and to do other things with it then it becomes blameworthy bayan al-ilm allazi huwa fard ayn there is in our tradition one very clear distinction between uh, that the knowledge that is uh, that is needed that is for the ayn that is an obligation that is knowledge that is obligatory there is no choice for any muslim not to know that knowledge that part of knowledge that is for the ayn every individual needs to know how to pray how to how to do wudu how to perform hajj how to fast how to calculate zakat all of those things are for the ayn and then there is for the kifaya for the kifaya is any knowledge that is for the kafaya uh, is is the knowledge that we that not everybody needs to have in a given society but some people need to have so that knowledge is uh, such that uh, if some people know the knowledge of medicine some people have knowledge of uh, woodworking and some people have knowledge of uh, other trades that suffices the entire community meaning not everyone needs to be a doctor or a, or an engineer or a carpenter or a plumber some people would suffice for the other so these are the needs of this dunya and uh, uh, if there is uh, if there is no one uh, then the whole the whole community would suffer like if if there is a widespread famine if there is widespread uh, plague if there is disaster for the agriculture like all of those require some people to have knowledge when we say that uh, for the ayn 
the part of knowledge that is uh, essential for everyone. We don't mean that everyone needs to be a mufassir of the Quran. We don't mean everyone needs to be a mufti. What is said is being said is that uh, everyone needs to have. Any everyone needs to have essential knowledge of how to how to. how to uh, how to do their part which is obligatory on them and that part is essentially connected with the fraud that we have with the essential aspects of our deen uh, then he goes on to uh, degrees of uh, degrees of uh, knowledge and uh, is uh, by the time he was uh, writing there was this hair splitting of legal aspects of our deen and he has a very strong allergy against uh, uh, that kind of hair splitting knowledge and uh, in many places in his in his different works, he actually is uh, very vocal about uh, the fatwas which were being issued and uh, the details and theoretical and uh, theoretical discussions and all of those. He uh, he's very strong about it. Just to quickly finish his, uh, his overall scheme here, uh, just so that we, we are somewhat uh, interested in uh, reading these 150 pages of uh, uh, one of the highlights of the entire later production of books by Imam Ghazali, like later after his uh, so-called crisis when he came back, is the emphasis on what he calls tafsil ilm yani in this book is tariqul akhira the 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 path to the hereafter so this this is a very important aspect of uh, kitab al ilm of uh, imam ghazali because uh, uh, he is really unique in combining the intellectual approaches to knowledge with the with the experiential approaches and this unique aspect of uh, of uh, al umudin is one of the one of the reasons there are many reasons why this book has survived for so long and why it is so um, deeply rooted in our both spheres in the intellectual sciences as well as in the transmitted uh, sciences because this book combines the beauties and the benefits of both kinds. And also I think because it is still relevant, it is still very much uh, very much uh, related to what's happening now. For instance, when he goes into the discussion of uh, what people of knowledge should do in relation to the Salatin, in relation to the to the rulers, um, you know, this also is in continuity of what happened with the Imam Al Bukhari, for example. Like when he went back after a lifetime of uh, meeting people in the transmission of the of the of the hadith tradition everything when he reached when he went back to bukhara and the ruler wanted him to come to the palace to teach his son he said no if you want your son to be taught send it send him to me I'm not going to come to your palace. And this is what happened. This ruler just uh, 
he did what rulers do like he just stirred up a false uh, storm against Imam Bukhari and uh, uh, he was actually expelled and while he was leaving and he, it was his uh, he reached out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, you know what happened to that ruler after that so we any this is this is one of the beauties of uh, ihya alumuddin that the content is still relevant to what's happening now so we have we have lots of uh, very influential religious scholars and when uh, when gaza happens what happens to those people we don't hear a single word. Their heart doesn't bleed. Nothing happens. So what happens to their knowledge then? What is the... Um, so you know, these are some aspects of uh, knowledge which are inherent in our tradition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this a living tradition that is self cleansing self cleansing is there and self uh, authentication is there uh, there is an inherent mechanism that distinguishes between real knowledge and false knowledge and real knowledge is the knowledge that speaks out real knowledge is the knowledge that is internalized real knowledge is the knowledge that is in sync with the pulse of the uh, of the time like we don't have professors uh, who would lecture on ethics and then go home and their ethics they have no ethics we don't anyway those those people are not called people of knowledge in our in our tradition the book really uh, ends with uh, some very <clears throat> um, some very very uh, insightful that's the word very insightful discussion on uh, the intellect and the the ways to acquire knowledge. Now, Al-Aql, we have talked about it a few times in the past, but what is the reality of intellect and what are the kinds? This last two, like 20 pages, the last 20 pages are just, so Ma'ani Al-Yaqeen, so we have this, these three, degrees of certitude and they're all connected with knowledge we have the knowledge ilmul yaqeen and then we have ayn al yaqeen and then we have haqq al yaqeen so i would encourage everyone to get a copy these are all available on the internet in pdf forms if you don't have the actual book are there any questions? Shala, we are going to going to continue with the ayah number thirty-two of Surah Al-Baqarah after after uh, two Sundays. Uh, next two Sundays, I'm traveling, so there won't be any class. So when we resume, that will be the first Sunday of November. Then we inshallah proceed with ayah number 32, which is very important for us in the context of what was taught to Adam alayhi salam. Are there any questions? So I hope you will use uh, these two weeks to just go through this book. I mean, this is would be a wonderful conclusion to the last three sessions on knowledge. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the knowledge, the real knowledge, the beneficial knowledge, and may He grant us the ability and tafiq to reshape ourselves according to what He teaches us of the haqq of the truth. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Ya Allah, anta halimun kareemun azimun tuhibu al-afwa fa'afu anna ya kareem fa'afu anna fa'afu anna Allah ma iftah lana abwa bi rahmatik ya kareem Allah mun surahwanana fi al-Falastin fi al-Ghazza wa fi kulli makan ya arakham al-Rahimin رب اغفر ورحم انت خیر الراحمین اللہم صلی علی سیدنا محمد و علی علیہ و اصحابہ اجمعین برحمتک یا ارحم الراحمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ